Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. One king, one, you huskies. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches, back to the days of the gold rush, with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Say, the owl is a wise old bird, and here's my idea of someone who's plenty smart, too. It's the fellow or girl who eats a breakfast of Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat with milk or cream and fruit. These king-size, ready-to-serve premium grains of rice or wheat are shot from guns. Yes, actually exploded up to eight times normal size to make them bigger and better tasting. No fooling. Wheat or rice shot from guns is so crisp and tender, it melts in your mouth. Shot through and through with bang-up nut-like flavor, too. And it's good for you. So tomorrow morning, be smart. Enjoy this breakfast treat. Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Fifteen years in prison had left their mark on young Frank Carney. His eyes had hardened. His hair was prematurely shot with gray. His face was stamped with lines of bitterness. All through those years in prison, he had lived with a single purpose in mind. To get revenge on Roy Neeland, the man who had framed him on a false charge of embezzlement to cover his own systematic theft of company funds. Now Frank Carney's term was up. And as he listened to the warden in the Seattle prison, his eyes smoldered with hatred and the lust for vengeance. Now, Carney, there's no sense going out of here with a chip on your shoulder. You've got a lot of nerve handing me your pious sermons. You haven't lost 15 of the best years of your life in a prison cell for a crime you didn't commit. Carney, you had a fair trial. There wasn't an ounce of proof to back up your story that Roy Nealon framed you. <laughs> no. No, Nealon was too slick for that. But I've got a hunch he won't be feeling quite so chipper when he finds out I've gotten out of the penitentiary. Eh, you may as well forget about Neeland. He went to the Yukon during the gold rush. I know all about Neeland. Including the fact that he's living up in Dawson City. What? And he owns a nice, prosperous little supply business. How do you know that? Because I made it my business to keep informed of every move Neeland made while I was behind bars. Are you implying that you intend to get even with Roy Neeland? What do you think, Warden? What do you think? It was more than a month later that Frank Carney arrived at Dawson City on board the Yukon Star, last steamer of the season to make the trip downriver from Whitehorse. Winter was already closing down in the Yukon. The ground was covered with the first snow of the season. As Carney stood at the top of the gangplank, speaking to the purser of the boat before disembarking. So this is Dawson City. This is it, mister. Rainbow's end for the gold rushes and trail's end for a lot of them. You know of a good hotel I can put up at? Well, one's pretty much like another in this town. You'll find three or four fairly decent ones down the main street a ways. That kid down there can probably show you the way. Oh, you mean that kid with the dog? Yes, the one that's making a snowball. <laughs> Looks like he's getting ready to <laughs> let fly. Yes, right at that sour-looking geezer that come aboard to buy the Seattle paper. <laughs> Bullseye, he caught the old gent right in back of the ear. you treacherous little fool cat. When I lay my hands on you, I'll thrash you within an inch of your life. Oh. Looks like the kid didn't run fast enough. Now I'm going to sit in your hands good and proper. Too bad that dog ain't a little bigger. All he can do is yip at the old cute seals. Yeah. Hey, where are you going? I'm going over and interfere. He's getting a little too rough with that kid. All right, mister, you spanked the kid enough. Yeah, maybe you didn't know that this brat just hit me with a snowball. I saw the whole thing happen. You've spanked him, so let him go. Suppose you mind your own business. Look, mister, I don't want any trouble, but you've been wailing that kid just a little too hard. 
Now take your hands off him or I'll give you a taste of your own medicine. Oh, very well. I'll drop the matter for the time being. But you listen to me, young man. I'm going to stop by your father's store to give him this paper. And believe me, I intend to give him a full report of this whole affair. Now, good day to both of you. The old crab. <laughs> Sounds like you two don't get along so well. Who is that man? His name's Clem Gunther. He and his brother Jeff run a mine broker's office next door to my father's store. <laughs> By the way, mister, thanks a lot. That's all right, Sonny. How come you bothered to stick up for me like that? Oh, I don't know. I kind of like kids, I guess. I oh, say, you said your father owned a store, didn't you? That's right. He sells supplies to miners and prospectors. Then maybe you can help me find the place I'm looking for. It's a store run by a man called Nealon. Roy Nealon. Oh, that's my father. What? Your father? Sure, I'm Jackie Nealon. But uh, I never knew Roy had a son. Are you a friend of Dad's, mister? A friend? Why, yeah. I used to be quite a good friend of your dad's. A long time ago, that is. Gee, I bet he'll be glad to see you. Come on, I'll take you over to the store. Oh, no. No, no, don't bother. I've got to check in at a hotel first. Then I'll find my way over. Okay. It's down that way two blocks. You'll find it easy. There's a big sign over the store. Sure, sure. I'll find it. Thanks a lot. Buzz and I'll run home and tell Mom that a friend of Dad's has arrived in town. Oh, by the way, mister, what's your name in case Mom remembers you? Just tell her Frank Carney has arrived in town. I think she'll remember the name. Business was almost over at the Nealon Supply House... Roy Nealon, the proprietor, was already adding up the day's receipts as Clem Gunther walked into the store. Roy, a sharp-featured man of early middle age, looked up at his visitor and said, Oh, it's you, Clem. Did you get that Seattle paper for me? Yes, Roy, I got it off the Yukon Star right after she docked. It cost me 25 cents, I might add. Fine. Here, Clem, thanks. It looks like you've taken in quite a bit of money today. Over $8,000, I expect. I haven't finished counting it yet. Roy, I've got a bone to pick with you. What's wrong? It's that boy of yours, Jackie. What? When I was down at the landing, he hit me right behind the ear with a snowball. <laughs> with a snowball? Well, now, I'm right sorry about that, Clem. It's no laughing matter. <laughs> Next time it happens, I'm going to have the law on that boy. Now, Clem, don't go getting up on your high horse. I'll have a talk with Jackie when I get home tonight. Yes, you do. In the meantime, let's see what it says in this Seattle paper. Hmm. See where William Jennings Bryan is touring the country again. Wait a minute. What's this? Why, what's the matter, Roy? What are you looking so upset about? Nothing, nothing at all. Someone I knew back in the States just got out of prison, that's all. Why, you're white as a sheet. Here, let me see. Yeah. Frank R. Carney, convicted embezzler, was released today from the state penitentiary after completing his 15-year sentence. Well, what about it? What's that got to do with you? Nothing. Except that Carney always claimed I framed him. It's not true, of course. But now that he's out of prison... Oh, yes, he might try to get even with you. That it? Yes, I'm afraid he might. What? What are you taking out that six-shooter for, Roy? This paper is more than a month old. For all I know, Frank Carney may have arrived on the same boat. Anyway, from now on, I'm not taking any chances. Looks like you got another customer. What? Oh, yes. Good afternoon, sir. Can I help? Frank Carney. So you recognize me, eh, Roy? I wasn't sure you'd remember me after all these... Don't raise that gun, Roy. I got you covered. You too, mister. Well, if it is an old sourpuss... My, my name is Clem Gunther. What do you intend to do, Frank? What do you think? No, Frank. Don't shoot me. I'll give you money. There's 8,000 right here. And I can scrape up more. Lots more. Do you think money can pay me back for all those years I spent in prison? Frank, please. Think of my family. My wife and boy. Look at that picture. There they are. My wife and my son, Jackie. You don't deserve a family like that, Roy. Frank, listen. Listen to me. Stop please. your blubbering, Neil. <laughs> no. Don't. I... <laughs> I'm not going to kill you. I thought I could. Even after talking to Jackie down at the landing. But I can't go through with it. <laughs> Thanks for that. You'll never regret this. I, I promise you. Neeland, I, I hope I never see you again. 
If I ever do, I may change my mind and give you what you deserve. Well, that was a close call. Yeah, it was a mighty close call. Yeah. Hey, put down that gun, Clem. Have you gone crazy? On the contrary, I never made a smarter move in my life. Frank Carney has just given me a chance to pick up $8,000. You said you had that much here in the store. Clem! Carney will be blamed for what happens to you. No, no, no! No! Clem Gunther put the gun beneath his coat and then worked with frenzied no. eagerness cleaning out the cash box. He stuffed Roy's money into his pockets and then opened the door to spread the alarm. Help! Murder! Police! It was several minutes before the Mounties arrived at the scene of the crime. And in that interval, Clem Gunther was able to slip the money and gun to his startled brother Jeff in their office next door to the Neyland Supply House. A short time later, Clem was pouring out his story to Sergeant Preston while a constable stood guard at the front door to keep out the excited mob. Yes, yes, Sergeant. Roy begged for mercy, but Carney paid no attention. He shot him in cold blood. Then what happened, Clem? Why, then he scooped up all the money and ran out the back door. I see. A town like Dawson shouldn't be hard to find a man who's just stepped off the boat. Now, Clem, you'd better come along to identify Carney. Within half an hour, Sergeant Preston had located Carney in his room at the Royal Albert Hotel. Carney's face bore a look of blank surprise as he listened to the Mountie. I'm Sergeant Preston, Northwest Mounted Police. I'll have to hold you for the murder of Roy Neeland. What? Neeland murdered? You seem surprised. Of course I'm surprised. Stop acting, Carney. I saw the whole thing. You shot Roy Neeland and took all the money in the cash box. Why, you lying skunk. Did you go to Neeland's store? Well, yes, but, but I didn't kill him. Here's my gun. You can see for yourself it hasn't been fired. You've had lots of time to clean and reload it. Well, then search my room. You can see for yourself I haven't got any money hidden anywhere except what I got right here in my wallet. Very well, Connie. I have no warrant. But with your permission, I will search the room. A careful search revealed that the stolen money was nowhere in the room. But Clem Gunther hastened to renew his accusation. Never mind, Sergeant. He's the murderer, all right. There's plenty of places he could have hidden the money after leaving the store. Gunther, you lying rat. Wait. You must have killed Neeland yourself. Why don't you search him, Sergeant? I'll be glad to be searched. Go right ahead, Sergeant. You can attend to that at headquarters, Clem. In the meantime, Carney, you're under arrest. I warn you, anything you say may be used against you. We'll continue our story in just a moment. I wonder if we're going to have a visitor today. Well, sure enough. And our visitor is a lady. A rather elderly one and dressed up a bit behind the times. Hello but... there, young man. Why, hello. I'm the old woman who lives in the shoe. You're what? You're the old woman who lives in the shoe? Yes, indeed. Well, I, I guess the housing shortage is rather bad. Oh, we don't mind. We? Yes, myself and all the children. Oh, that's right. You're the lady with so many children, you don't know what to do. But I do. Huh? I mean, I do know what to do with the children. I see. They're really very well behaved nowadays. Oh? Especially around breakfast time. Ah. Everything's fine now. Since we started having good breakfast of Quaker Puff to eat, and Quaker puff rice. I take it the children kind of go for wheat or rice shot oh, from guns. Indeed they do. We have the wheat one morning, rice the next. That's a fine idea. It's easy on me too, what with having such a large family. You mean because Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are so easy to serve? Yes, and with milk or cream and fruit, they make an economical nourishing breakfast. That's right. Wheat or rice shot from guns furnishes added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Oh, oh land's sakes, I must be going now. Back to the shoe? I mean home? My, yes. I've got to fix everyone's Supper? Supper? Oh, gee, I don't envy you that job. Oh, there's nothing to it. The children have been so good lately, I promised them a special treat tonight. Their choice of Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat with their favorite fruit. Well, uh, goodbye for now. <laughs> well, sir, that's a fine idea. Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat hit the spot at supper time as well as breakfast time. These king-size kernels are shot from guns to make them bigger and better tasting. Yes, they're actually exploded up to eight times normal size to make them crisp and tender. Don't be missing out. Make sure you get both delicious kinds. 
Quaker puffed wheat, and Quaker puffed rice tomorrow. Now to continue our story. When a constable brought word to Mrs. Nealon that Carney had been captured, her son Jackie was considerably upset. Mom, would you mind if I went out for a little while? Oh, it's awfully dark out, Jackie. Couldn't you wait till tomorrow? No, please, Mom. I'll take Buzz with me. <laughs> well, all right. But bundle up warmly and please don't be gone long. I won't, Mom. I promise. Meanwhile, Clem Gunther had left Mounted Police Headquarters and gone home to the cabin on the outskirts of Dawson, which he shared with his brother Jeff. As the elderly mine broker entered the cabin, Jeff looked up apprehensively. Oh, it's you, Clem. Yes, of course it's me, Jeff. Have you got the money and the gun I left with you? Yeah, the stuff's right here. Hey, would you mind telling me what this is all about? I shot Nealon myself and grabbed his money. What? <laughs> yeah, I thought as much. But how did you manage to throw the blame on Carney? Carney claims Roy Nealon framed him for embezzlement back in the States. Uh -huh. Came busting into the store while I was there all set to shoot Nealon. But when he saw that picture of Roy's wife and kid, he couldn't do it. Uh -huh. After he walked out of the store, I grabbed Nealon's gun and shot him. And I helped myself to the money in the till and ran out into the street shouting murder. <laughs> it was a perfect setup. <laughs> By golly, that was sure slick. That $8,000 is going to come in mighty handy, too. I'll stash that money away under my bunk. Oh, and give me Neelan's six-shooter. I'd better clean it and figure out some way to slip it back into the store. Soon after Clem had hidden away the money, Jackie Neelan arrived at the Gunther cabin. <laughs> Before knocking on the door, he paused momentarily to peer in the cabin window. By the light of the flickering oil lamp that illuminated the cabin, he saw Clem Gunther cleaning a familiar-looking ivory-handled six-shooter. That's Dad's gun he's cleaning, Buzz. I'm sure of it. I can tell by that carved ivory handle. A moment later, Clem and Jeff Gunther were startled by a knock at the door. I say, someone's at the door. You suppose I was seen through the window cleaning the gun? I don't know. You'd better hide it. Yeah. yeah. Jackie Nealon. What are you doing here, kid? Sergeant Preston wants to see you and your brother at headquarters. Uh, at headquarters? Why, I just came from there. I know, but, but something new has come up. I went to headquarters to see if they had caught Carney, and, and Sergeant Preston asked me to get you two. Well, why does he want to see me? I don't know nothing about what happened. Never mind arguing, Jeff. If the sergeant wants to see us, he must have a good reason. Just wait till we get our coats on, my boy, and we'll come right along. Jackie traveled but a short distance with Clem and Jeff. Then he turned in the direction of his home. When he was sure the brothers were out of sight, he circled back to their cabin. Come on, Buzz. The cabin was lighted by brilliant moonlight streaming in through the windows. Quiet, Buzz. Just wait till I pull off my mittens. There. Now let's look for that gun. Clem was standing right next to this drawer when I saw him. I'll bet this is where he put it. I was right, Buzz. It's here. Removing the gun from the drawer, Jackie carried it over to the window to examine it more closely. Oh, this is Dad's gun. It's got his initials carved here, real small on the ivory. That means Clem Gunther must have killed Dad and, and blamed it on Mr. Carney. Oh, oh, but they've got the money hidden around here somewhere, too. Come on, Buzz, let's find it. A few moments later, as he was searching intently for the hidden money, Jackie froze with fear at the sound of the cabin door opening. <gasps> to his horror, as he jerked around, he saw Clem and Jeff Gunther framed in the doorway. Are you looking for something, Jackie? <laughs> I just came back to see if I left my mittens. I suppose that's why you're poking around under those blankets. You scheming little polecat. I suspected that was just a story about Preston wanting us. That's why we came back here. That gun. It's out on the table. You must have found it in the drawer. Get it, Jeff. Now then, kid, you come here. If you want me, you'll have to catch me. No, you don't. You're not getting away. You're not getting there. Tie his hands, Jeff. Right. And don't try shouting for help, kid. It'll be the last noise you ever make. Tell that dog of yours to shut up, too. Unless you want his head bashed in. Quiet down, boy. Don't make any noise. Uh, yeah, I guess that'll hold you. What are we going to do with the kid, Clem? Uh, let's see. Uh, you know that old Gallagher mine? Yeah, just outside of town. No one works it anymore. Take the boy there and wait till you hear from me. I'll stick around the cabin for a while and see if anyone comes looking for him. What about the dog? Boot him out. Oh, wait, wait. Better put him in a bag and take him with you. All right. Now get going right now. 
Meanwhile, at Mounted Police Headquarters, Sergeant Preston had been carefully cross-examining Frank Carney. Carney, by trying to take the law into your own hands, you've laid yourself wide open to the charge of murder. Yet I can't help believing you're innocent. Sergeant, I... I swear I never shot Roy Nealon. That's the gospel truth. Well, if you're innocent, Connie, there's only one man who can possibly be guilty. And that man is Clem Gunther. I think maybe I better have another talk with Clem. Come on, King. We're going out to Gunther's cabin and see what we can learn. A short time later, Sergeant Preston and King arrived at their destination. Uh, oh, it's you, Sergeant. Uh, come on in. Thanks, Clem. Come on, King. What brings you here, Sergeant? Has... Carney confessed? No, Clem, he hasn't. Frankly, I'm not satisfied that he's guilty. What? You mean you think I'm the one who's lying? I'm not making any accusations. I'd just like to ask you a few more questions, that's all. Go right ahead. In the first place, Clem, it doesn't seem... Wait a minute. Looks as if King's found something. What is it, boy? Oh, a pair of mittens, eh? Small ones. Whose are they, Clem? They certainly don't belong to you or Jeff. Why, oh, they uh, belong to that boy who works for me. You know, the one who uh, runs errands for Jeff and me down at the office. Oh. He happened to stop by here tonight, and I guess he left these behind. I see. Well, Clem, as I was saying... It Sergeant Preston proceeded to question Clem about the details of the murder. Although he failed to shake the mine broker's original testimony, he sensed very clearly that Gunther was laboring under intense nervous strain. Sergeant Preston left the cabin and went only a short distance, hiding in a clump of trees where he could watch any comings or goings that might occur. Yes, King. Clem Gunther lied to us. Those mittens you found belonged to Jackie Neeland. I remember noticing the red pattern when I saw Jackie this afternoon. Unless I miss my guess, we've thrown a scare into Clem. Let's see what develops. A short time later, the Mountie and his dog saw Clem Gunther emerge from the cabin. Looks like we were right, King. Something's up. We'll follow Gunther and see where he goes. Clem Gunther went directly to the deserted Gallagher mine where his brother was holding Jackie Neeland. The darkness and the fringe of trees bordering the trail enabled Sergeant Preston and King to follow at a safe distance, unobserved. Apparently unaware he had been followed, Clem entered the curving mine shaft. Inside, he found Jeff and Jackie, with his hands still tied, seated among the rubble. A flickering candle threw weird, misshapen shadows across the walls of the mine. What's up, Clem? We're in a tight spot. That Mountie Preston showed up at the cabin. I think he suspects something has happened to the kid. How do you know? That dog of his found the kid's mittens. I have a hunch Preston recognized yeah, them. That's not so that's good. That's not all. He as much as told me he thinks I'm lying about Carney shooting Neelan. He questioned me for more than an hour, trying to trip me up. Why, you confounded fool, then why did you come here? If Preston is suspicious, he may have watched the cabin and trailed you here. I've already considered that possibility. In fact, that's precisely why I came here. Are you crazy? Now you listen to me, Jeff. Gag the kid and then snuff out that candle. I'll get my gun ready. When that red coat sticks his nose in here, he's going to get the surprise of his life. A short time later, Sergeant Preston approached the mouth of the mine shaft. The old Gallagher mine, eh? There's only one reason why Clem would be using this as a hideout. He and Jeff must be holding someone prisoner in there, and I'm willing to bet that prisoner is Jackie Neelan. King, what's that? Jackie's little dog named Buzz was in the cave inside a sack. He cried out for help when his dog sense told him King was near. Steady, King. Steady, boy. That must be Jackie's dog. Get that dog to my ass. Shut him up. I'm trying to find him. Put them back along the dark forest. I can't see in the dark. Wait a minute, King. Wait, boy. Those men are inside waiting for us. If I rush in, I'll be a perfect target. King caught the note of desperation in the small dog's voice. He looked at his master as if asking permission to respond to the cry for help. I have to think of something. Steady, King. Find that sack. Where'd you leave it? Shut that butt up. You two, I know you're in there. I'm calling on you to surrender. Come up with your hands up. Come and get us. Here's a sack. I'll fix this one for giving us a lamp. Buzz yipped in mortal terror when he felt cruel hands gripping the sack in which he was imprisoned. It was a cry King could not ignore. The mighty husky leaped ahead, charging into the cave. The darkness was no handicap to King. Clem turned and brought his gun around to fire. His shot went high. Before he could fire a second time, King leaped. Jeff! Jeff! I'll help you, Clem! Get that dog! Get him! Look out, Jeff! He's going for you! King's charge had driven Clem to the ground. 
The big dog turned his attention to Jeff, who dropped the sack containing Buzz in a frenzied effort to defend himself. Stay where you are, both of you. You're covered. Clem lay on the floor of the cave in the light that leaked through the entrance. Sergeant Preston saw him reaching to retrieve the gun he had dropped. No, you don't. Go oh, out! You stand on my hand! I'll take that gun. Down, Kings. All right, boy, I'll take over. All right, get up. On your feet, both of you. My hand is... While King stood guard, Sergeant Preston untied Jackie and removed the gag. Oh. Then, after releasing Buzz from the sack, he marched his prisoners to the open air. You're both under arrest in the name of the Queen. The charge is murder. I didn't have anything to do with the murder, Sergeant Preston. Clem was the one who killed Neil. Jeff, you What about the money? It's back in the cabin, Sergeant. I, I was going to split the door with Clem. I'll admit that. Jeff, you can tell that to the jury. Uh, Dad rat a little dog. If it hadn't been Jackie, for him, Jackie, you can be mighty proud of Buzz. Oh, oh, golly, it's nice of you to say that, Sergeant Preston. But King's the one who came to the rescue. Oh, golly, King. You just wait till tomorrow. My mom will buy you the biggest steak in Dawson. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jackie, <laughs> I guess King's trying to tell you that he's going to split that steak with his small friend, Buzz. Now, Jackie, let's get on to town. This case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure. Be careful. Accidents can happen. Yes, fellas and girls, accidents do happen. Every few seconds, there's an accident. And someone's hurt. So be careful. Most accidents are due to just plain carelessness. Use your old bean when you're playing out of doors. Don't dash out into the street after a baseball. Be careful when you cross streets. And don't be a smart aleck on your bike or ride in the dark without lights. Don't take chances. Not even a little chance. Now, more than ever, be extra careful. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from gun. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King... Meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case, Fire in the Sky. King and I thought we were going to have a nice vacation. A full two weeks of hunting and fishing. But there in the hills northwest of Dawson, we discovered that Jake Barton was planning to commit murder. And when we saw the flames in the sky above the camp on McLaren Creek, it seemed that King and I must arrive too late. That three men and a girl were sure to die. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure... Friday. Boys and girls, can you guess what your dog likes best? That's right, meat. That's why over one million cans of kennel ration are sold every week. Because kennel ration is made with lean red meat. Choice cuts of U.S. government inspected horse meat. Have mom open a can. She'll like the appetizing aroma and you will actually see the chunks of meat. And kennel ration has all the vitamins and minerals that keep dogs in top health. Have mom get kennel ration today. Kennel ration, first in canned dog food. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puff Wheat.